we took a completely different approach because again, I felt like this is something that you can create a real community around, which is obviously a big part of what Lancaster County is known for is that kind of communal aspect. And I really just wanted to carry that into the hemp industry because we have an opportunity here to create how a whole industry does business. That's Caleb Kaufman from Lancashire Hemp Farms in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. This is the Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast. My name is Eric Carlock, and today I'll talk to Caleb about growing hemp, building a co-op of farmers, the importance of good business practices, and how his own journey of trauma and healing brought him into the world of industrial hemp. But first, a word from our sponsor, and then a few nuggets of hemp news. Today's show is sponsored by King's AgriSeeds. King's AgriSeeds 2021 hemp lineup includes two new F1 autoflower hybrids, Auto CBD Alpha Explorer and Alpha Nebula, which were both screened at King's Research Farm in Christiana, Pennsylvania. You can earn free seeds by committing early on these new hybrids. First deadline is December 18th. Terms and conditions apply. Call 717-687-6224 or go to kingsagriseeds.com for more information. All right, a few nuggets of hemp news. This one comes from the Boston Globe headline, Legislature Extends a Lifeline to Massachusetts Hemp Farmers. The story says, After two dismal seasons that saw the market for their crop sharply curtailed by conflicting regulations, Massachusetts hemp farmers and their supporters are cheering a new state budget amendment that would extend a lifeline to the promising agricultural sector. The provision would allow hemp farmers to sell their plants to legal marijuana dispensaries. It was introduced by Republican State Senator Ryan Fatman of Webster and is headed to Governor Charlie Baker's desk after a successful vote in the legislature on Friday. Proponents hope it will create a lucrative new market for hemp farmers who have been hamstrung by state rules banning them from the most profitable segment of the industry edible products containing cannabidiol, or CBD, a popular cannabis-derived compound that doesn't get users high and may have health benefits. At the same time, it should provide marijuana dispensaries and their suppliers with a cheaper source of CBD, lowering prices for consumers. Here's one from Delaware. The Delaware Department of Agriculture reminds hemp producers who register their growing sites. You can use the growing site registration form to register online before February 1st. Also, any individual who intends to grow, cultivate, or distribute hemp, including transplants, seedlings, or clones, must apply to be a Delaware Domestic Hemp Production Program producer with renewal required every three years. Here's a story from hempgrower.com. Headline, USDA expands crop insurance pilot program for hemp. The story says that the USDA will be providing additional access to its pilot crop insurance program the pilot multi peril crop insurance, the MPCI plan, in 2021 with other coverage options on the way next year. According to a November 30th press release, the USDA is expanding the program to new states, including Arizona and Texas, and more counties in Tennessee, Colorado, and Kentucky. In 2021, the MPCI will also allow coverage if growers have a contract to purchase the insured hemp and meet all applicable state, tribal, and federal regulations. All right, here's a story from the Midwest. This one was published on OurQuadCities.com. It says that on Tuesday, December 15th, Muscatine Community College will host an information session for anyone interested in learning more about its industrial hemp production program. The session will begin at 5.30 p.m. on the college's Facebook page. This fall, Muscatine Community College launched its new one-year diploma program designed to teach students how to grow, harvest, process, and market industrial hemp. And then just one more. This one comes from Hemp Industry Daily. The headline reads, European Commission reverses course, says CBD should not be regulated as a narcotic. The story says that makers of CBD foods and supplements no longer face the prospect of a blanket ban in Europe after the European Commission revised its preliminary stance that CBD should be treated as a narcotic. The Commission sent a statement to the European Industrial Hemp Association that hemp-derived cannabidiol should not be regulated as a narcotic and therefore can qualify as a food. 
The decision comes as a relief to Europe's hemp industry, reassuring processors and manufacturers that their CBD edible products will not be banned from the EU market. I'll have links to all these stories on the show page for this episode at LancasterFarming.com. All right, well, let's get into my interview with Caleb Kaufman from Lancashire Hemp. Caleb Kaufman, welcome to the Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Thank you. Could you introduce yourself for us? Yeah, yeah. Like you said, I'm Caleb Kaufman. I am the founder of Lancashire Hemp. We're located in uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And right now, uh, from our 2020 co-op, we had about 15 Amish farmers in our co-op growing for hemp flour. And uh, that's kind of where we're at this year. Okay, so are you yourself a farmer or are you sort of organize the uh, the growers? I do both. So yeah, I did start uh, farming hemp and I still did even this year. I did size down my personal farm so I could make space to do more of the management of the co-op. But yeah, I do also grow. Okay. Um, and you're growing for CBD? Yes. Okay. Cool. So between the 15 Amish farmers and yourself, um, like what's your total output or acreage or however you want to quantify that? Yeah, this year we scaled back um, just because we, you know, everyone had a hard first year 2019 in hemp and we scaled back to just do a really high quality premium flower. We did about 18 acres um, between those 15 farms to so try to keep it around an acre per farm in kind of a micro farming mindset. Um, So what each Amish farmer would have like half an acre to an acre or so on on his farm? Yeah, typically, yep. And then so you're you're just growing for the flower market. You're not going to do any processing other than like the hand trimming of buds or what what else is sort of in your, your business plan? Yeah, we were this year we did focus on the flower um, because the market for that is I'll say bigger um, from my experience. There's definitely more outlets where biomass is tough. So we did want to stay away from that this year. Um, We still have, you know, some and we'll continue to grow biomass in the future. But our main focus would be the premium hemp flower just because of the market. Um, I feel like Lancaster County land is also set up better for uh, CBD hemp flower just because we do have, you know, smaller farms. Uh, We're not mass farms with hundreds of acres, right, you know, right. maybe like you'd find out West. So it felt right with, uh, the kind of the soil we have here, the setup of the farms to kind of stick with what we do best, which would be, you know, high quality, a lot of handwork. Mm-hmm. Um, and that just kind of fits, you know, the environment around here. Right. Right. Yeah. Lancaster County is just like this patchwork of little family farms. It's pretty amazing. Yes. Yeah. And there's with the sort of the the dairy industry is kind of a little wacky right now. So I imagine uh, some of your Amish farmers were sort of looking for other revenue streams. Yeah, that's definitely true. Uh, A lot of those guys, you know, did come out of dairy farming, switch to either produce um, and other cash crops. So hemp did fit in well, you know, with farmers that were looking for something to bring in some revenue outside of dairy or produce. Mm -hmm. Um, And it also fit in well with produce farmers because kind of works and fits with uh, the seasons of kind of filling in the gaps. Right. Right. Um, Well, how does it work setting up a co-op? Is that like a special legal entity or, you know, can you just explain how you set up a co-op and how it works and how people join it and just talk about the co-op? Yeah, no, that's a great way to put it too. Um, Honestly, I think the co-op is more of a mindset. Um, You know, I started my small hemp farm in 2019, like a lot of other guys, and quickly realized that a single farmer on his own really doesn't stand a chance out there. There's just, you know, there's just hundreds of farmers. There's no infrastructure in hemp. You know, this is a new industry. Um, So those are big enough hurdles as it is. So for a single farm, um, if you don't have every single tool in your tool belt, you know, you're you're really going to struggle. And I guess by tools in your tool belt, I mean, if you're good at growing that, you know, that's step one, but then you also have to have, you know, the strategy for, okay, how am I going to dry this? How am I going to cure it? 
How am I going to sell it? How am I going to market it? Um, and sometimes I was finding with farmers, they didn't have quite that game plan. They're just, hey, we can grow really good, high quality hemp. And then, you know, they're going to get kind of stuck with it because there's no real outlets. Right. Um, so out of that, I kind of realized like, well, if we stick together and we form a co-op and kind of build some trust, we can actually, you know, represent ourselves to a larger market. Um, it's always better to stick in numbers. You can just, you know, we can offer better pricing for that reason. Um, just so many, so many benefits of sticking together. Um, and I guess going into detail with that, again, it's more of the mindset of, you know, just because I had this idea to do this and kind of founded Lancashire doesn't mean that I need to take, you know, all the profits. Um, so to me, it was really a switch of mentality. Okay. Um, so these guys aren't contracted. They're not like, um, commit, like how, how does, how does that work? Um, I'm not even sure what I'm trying to say, but it, uh, like, how are they part of the business if they're not contracted or are they contracted? Yeah. yeah. So that's a good question. I guess, again, it goes back to the mindset and it goes back to some trust. So, you know, when I go out to, um, farmers and we just have open, honest conversations and we just kind of lay out a game plan. So we do a lot of farmer meetings mm -hmm. and basically we got everybody together and I just said, okay, here's kind of a plan that we have moving forward. Um, we're going to grow these strains. We're going to, you know, work towards smokable flour. Everyone does their part. I'll kind of act as the facilitator. Mm -hmm. And we basically broke it down then by saying, all right, let's, let's say we're going to shoot for selling a pound of, you know, trimmed hemp flour at $350. So, you know, we did this in our, a meeting with about, again, 15 Amish farmers. And then we just started from there and we broke it down. Okay. So, you know, we said, all right, what, what would you be happy with getting per pound, you know, realistically as a farmer? So we landed at like $100 goes back to the farmer. And then again, we just started basically slicing that pie up and saying, okay, well, how much do we need to give for the drying services that we're using in that mm -hmm. machine? And then how much do we need to give to trimmers who are trimming this? And then, you know, how much do I get personally out of this for facilitating it? Um, and then whoever else is helping around, like, how do we get them part of that? So we just, we took a completely different approach um, because again, I felt like, this is something that you can create a real community around, um, which is obviously a big part of what Lancaster County is known for is that kind of communal aspect. Mm -hmm. um, you find that in the plain communities, the farming communities here. And I really just wanted to carry that into the hemp industry um, because we have an opportunity here to create how a whole industry does business. Yeah. I mean, an opportunity like this, usually doesn't happen, you know, where like a brand new industry comes out of essentially nowhere and then sort of revolutionizes the space, really. Um, it's exciting times to be in agriculture. Yeah, yeah, it really is. And I like how you use the word revolution. I, I like to think of kind of what we're doing is trying to revolutionize the way that we approach business in general. I guess we'll just say, you know, in the United States, you know, we are very capitalistic and there's nothing wrong with capitalism. Um, but I guess, you know, for me, part of my values are that communal aspect and kind of putting the self and the ego aside and saying, hey, if we, you know, work as a team and we think of this as a community and treat it as a community, what uh, a wonderful thing you can create. So I kind of took this approach and I, I guess I call it more of like a socialistic capitalism where, hey, we're trying to make money. Um, and that's okay. People should be allowed to make money and not feel bad. But I think there is a, a better way to go about doing business and making money. Um, and that's part of, you know, why I reached out to you and we started talking about doing this podcast was, um, I'm sure anyone listening that's a hemp farmer can relate that the business practices that are happening right now in the hemp industry, in my opinion, are just sad. Um, mm. We're supposed to be known as the industry that is bringing healing and life. Um, you know, most people that got into hemp got in because they probably had some 
um, personal experience using CBD that either changed their life or a family member's life um, and got really excited about, you know, sharing that with the world. And I think in the process of, you know, being a new industry, having hard times, um, you know, people have forgotten that. And I guess my hope as what we're doing here is to kind of be a beacon of light to say, you know what, there is a, a better way we can approach this that we can, you know, treat each other right, not ripping each other off or disappearing and just, you know, not paying people. Um, just a lot of that stuff that's happening in the industry right now. Hmm. So a couple of comments there. Like one, what you're saying to me harmonizes with what a lot of guests on our show talk about when they talk about like the business of hemp, that it's sort of a, a new paradigm, sort of like there's more than profit. It's it's about people and planet and profit. Yeah, definitely. That definitely uh, resonates with what we're doing here um, because this plant in my opinion, can literally change the world. And I think a lot of people do believe that. Um, and again, that's what made me excited about just coming on here and maybe just being a voice to remind everyone about that in the hard times. You know, it's obviously, it's been a crazy year. Um, everyone is struggling, period, no matter what industry you're in, probably at mm -hmm. some capacity. Um, for, thus, for those of us in hemp, I'd say it's been extra tough because, yeah, we're in a second year as a new industry. Um, there's just such little infrastructure as it is throw, you know, the pandemic on top of it. It, it really, you know, creates a tough space. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I think like I've noticed some of what you're talking about. It's like there's this like shadiness that, that sort of creeps into this industry a bit. I've, you know, I've heard stories from different people in different different places around the country about some sort of shady business deals. And I wonder if that comes in from sort of like the, the black market side, you know, like the, the cannabis under prohibition side where the, all of the, the cannabis business dealings were kind of shady, just sort of by, by nature of their being illegal. And now that like it's a, a legal market and there's light, shining on things so we're starting to see some of these shady business practices is that am i am i off base there or is that sort of what you're getting at no yeah i think that is a lot of it um i'm sure there is definitely crossover from you know people that are in the cannabis industry that once hemp became legalized it's like all right there's a you know legal outlet um and then maybe just carried over those bad business practices um and it's it is kind of crazy because it's not you know people that you don't know, it's people in your backyard, um, people that you think you could trust. You know, I have guys that I have built relationships with and, you know, dropped off a hundred pounds of smokable flour and just never got paid. And wow. these are, you know, guys that I shook hands with, looked in the eye, visited their facility, built relationships over time. Um, but that kind of stuff is sadly way too common in the industry. Wow. Huh. That's really a shame. I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, it is. Um, you know what? And I am a believer in, you know, love and forgiveness. And again, part of me really wanting to come on this podcast was just uh, hopefully to bring some hope and say, you know what? It is tough, but there's a right way to do business. And I think I just want to kind of remind my fellow hemp farmers in the industry of like, hey, you know, and it's not all one sided. Sometimes it's, you know, sometimes it's on the broker side, sometimes it's on the farmer side. There's, there's always, you know, two sides to every story. Um, but I think if we can change our mentalities, which, you know, this leads me to a point of, I think we all got into the hemp industry because again, we wanted to bring that healing and uh, experience that we had and share that with the world. But then there's also the mentality of like, I call it kind of the hemp gold rush. You oh, know, everyone, totally, yeah. everyone was like had dollar signs in their eyes. Yep. Um, and I think we kind of, as an industry started off on the wrong foot because everything we did was, you know, I'll call it out and say it was kind of fueled by greed. If you're honest with it, you know? Oh yeah, definitely. In, in 2019, for sure. Like everybody jumped in and I heard, you know, like, Oh, I'm going to make $50,000 an acre on this, you know, or even more than that. And now you, you look back in that, like, that's, that's a lot of money. And, uh, the market sort of tanked. 
Yeah, people were throwing out crazy numbers like that. Um, and it was, it was, man, such a wild time, even 2019 compared to this year. Um, you know, people got the dollar signs. And to be fair, you know, there's a lot of that was out of desperation. You know, we talked about the dairy farmers sure. for, yep. for a second. So, you know, these are good, honest people out there. Um, that trying are, to feed their families, trying to right, pay their bills. Really just struggling. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, it's like, you know what? That's not an excuse to pass down bad business practices and just create an industry um, that's going to, it'll fail in that way. An industry cannot survive without trust and good business practices. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I say on this show a lot that, you know, from my observation, cannabis loves community. You know, it, it brings people together and it's, it's really been neat to see this larger community develop around this plant. So you can't go around burning bridges because that's no way to build community. Right. Yeah. That is one of my main philosophies is, yeah, I really just don't want to burn bridges with anybody. Um, you know, I think there's always a way to work things out, talk things through, Sometimes, you know, I guess there comes a point when you do have to close some doors and just say, well, you know, kind of to protect yourself or your business, can't can't make decisions like that anymore or do business with certain people, unfortunately. Um, but I think you learn your lessons and again, you kind of move forward with love and just try to create a better space for business. All right. Good. Um, so let's talk about some of the, the farming parts here what your yeah. the growers that you were working with um what kind of questions did they have or what sort of challenges did they face like were there, did you have a bunch of new farmers this year or were they guys that also grew in 2018 or 2019 uh, yeah a lot of our farmers well, i guess everybody was um a year two grower so that grew in 2019 that still wanted to continue on and you know kind of saw the bigger picture of yeah this is this is tough we didn't quite make you know, the money we were expecting, but it's new industry. So you kind of just have to, you know, put your, put your head down and do the work. So farmers started kind of coming back. Um, I guess, you know, the beginning of the year when it was still winter and expressing interest in growing. And again, it was like, well, if there's people out there wanting to do this, let's assemble. That's where the, the co-op, you know, burst out of. And most of the questions farmers were asking, and I think you know, wanting to know, well, what, what are good genetics? You know, what is a plant that I can grow that's going to yield a good crop, a sellable crop? Um, and then the main one is always, what are my outlets? Who right. is actually going to buy this? And yeah, say, where's the market, right? That's the number one uh, concern with every farmer in hemp is, yeah, what is the market? Um, and I guess that is really the biggest piece that I've brought, you know, to the co-op and forming it was the plan to get to market, how we were going to do that and, you know, how we would share the profits for that. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the one thing that like every hemp educator that I've talked to, it's like, that's the thing, know your market before, even before you, you plant your seeds, like know where it's going to go. Yep. So I would 100% agree with that. Yeah. Um, so what varieties did you choose? Yeah, this year we, we decided to work with a local breeder, um, and so they're, they're unknown strains, but we grew a lot of, it's called Wilhelmina and we grew Fame. And then we oh, also- Oh, you worked grew, with Atlas. I know. Yes. I yep. Know, so you uh, know Joe. Those names. Yeah, I know Joe. Yep. Yeah. Sure. We worked with Joe this year. Um, great guy. Absolutely. And uh, so we grew some of that. And then we did also do, he had some photo strains that we grew, some Tangerine. Um, we have some Kiva Rock. Mammoth and early abacus were the okay. four photos we did. And how did the autoflower turn out for you? Autoflower, I'll be honest, that's a tough one. Um, I think the autoflower is not quite ready for the flower market. Yeah, okay. I'll say it that way. Okay. Auto will be great for biomass um, as a flower. I think the genetics are just not quite there yet. Um, and I think with time, you know, they'll obviously be bred better and more solid. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it was definitely, uh, definitely a tough one selling Wilhelmina as a smokable flower. Oh, okay. Very interesting. But yeah, you know, I know Joe kind of signed up with us and we, you know, we kind of approached the year saying, all right, you know, there are newer strains for him as well. Um, and he's been really great working with. And we, we went in knowing, all right, this is a strain and we're going to kind of see what it 
what it can do and where it fits. Right. Right. So um, what kind of like unforeseen challenges did your growers run into this year? This year, man, the growing season felt very smooth. Um, We went out from the get go with a very solid plan. Um, So I guess, yeah, for maybe a little more detail on our co-op side, um, we kind of chose again, the genetics, kind of the size of the plots and put a limit on like, all right, you know, we just weren't going to let any of our farmers grow more than two acres. Hmm. Um, and then just kind of how we were growing them, the spacing and that type of thing. Um, so we were involved on those levels as well. Oh, so all your growers did it the same way, row spacing, that whole thing. Pretty much. Yeah, we did. You know, one of the things that we said we left up to farmers were um, at least this past year was how they wanted to fertilize. Um, Just because, you know, sometimes a farmer has a specific guy that he likes to work with um, to help him out on fertilization. So that was something we said, like, all right, you know, obviously keep it all natural. But if you have a preference to certain fertilizers in a way that you want to do it, you know, that's up to you. Okay. They do in like the plastic mulch or what? Yeah, we did. Uh, we did everything drip irrigation in plastic mulch, um, just to keep it again kind of uniform. Know what we're getting, and try to keep it as consistent as we can because we are, you know, we're selling this as kind of one umbrella under the Lancashire. So when we have all of our strains come in, we want to make sure you know everything is consistent. Okay, um, and that did work out really well. Good. Good, good. Um, and then, so what did you do for, for like trimming and drying? Like what was, wh- where did you take that stuff? Yeah. So it was kind of, the harvest season was different. Um, and it was, a, it ended up being really, it was fun. It's obviously a lot of work. Um, but we ended up kind of, I'll say, partnering with Keystone AgriScience, who mm-hmm. had the drying facility out in Narvon, PA. Right. Um, and we, um, they have trays that go into that machine. So we ended up delivering trays to a farm. They would go out, they would cut off kind of the secondary branches with the flower on, lay it neatly on those trays. And then it would usually be me. I'd go out with a box truck and we'd pick up stacks of stacks and stacks of just hemp flour. (laughs) And then we ran that through the uh, dehydrator here. Um, And I was actually the one running that, um, dryer last season. So I ran it again this season, um, and basically got all of our crop dried that way. And then now we have all of our dried crop in our facility. And now we have the long road of, you know, hand trimming, which is quite a lot of work when you're looking at 18 acres. And you're doing that now (laughs) that's like in process now. Yeah. So that's currently where we're at. Um, lots of hand trimming and then just, you know, building and uh, building the wholesale accounts we have. We're doing a lot of <clears throat> more of old fashioned door to door salesmanship. Um, we have a guy right now that goes out pretty much every day just to different shops and, you know, kind of comes with our price sheet and packaged package stuff. So we, we went all the way down to like pre-packaged items for flour. So, hmm. so I hope the answer is no, but did you have any like run in with law enforcement? Um, surprisingly, I have not had any run in. Um, I think one of one time I did get pulled over in the box truck because of a DOT tag. Um, but I didn't have any hemp in, so that was just kind of a nice bonus not to have to deal with that. <laughs> right. Right. Um, but yeah, no, I've, I haven't had any. Um, <laughs> and at this point I'm probably a little more loose than I should be because I almost always have bags of hemp in my car. <laughs> um, always going to the post office, you know, with hemp. So it's, it's become pretty routine for me that I don't even think about it anymore. So hopefully uh, it stays that way. Right, right, right. Yeah, such it's such a strange thing. It's like it's legal, but cops don't really understand what's what. Yeah, in general, though, I've heard, you know, there just hasn't been a lot of pushback from, you know, local, local law enforcement. Everyone seems to be pretty understanding that, you know, this is different. Um, and even with the state of where, uh, the mentality <clears throat> of marijuana is, you know, we're, I think, at a place in society, whether you agree or disagree, um, from a legal standpoint, it's becoming less and less. Right. A, yeah. The know, whole landscape thing. is changing. 
Um, yeah. So there's, there's also just like a lack of energy of like, you know, no one really wants to be out there pursuing hemp farmers right. um, and right. giving them a hard time. Well, that's good to hear. Yeah. Um, is so there is a, a decent market for Lancaster County flour at this point. Yeah. Um, smokable flour is definitely a good market to get into. And I'm not going to say that that means it's easy. Um, it's still a buyer's market because there is a lot of flour available, you know, just across the States. Um, it has to be really good flour too. The market's pretty picky just because most of the consumers come from a cannabis market hmm. and they're used to, you know, that high quality premium flour. Um, so you definitely have to put the work in, but if you, if you do and you, you, uh, succeed with that kind of a crop, there is definitely a market for it. All right. Well, who, who are the buyers? Um, I mean, obviously don't tell me names, but you know, in general. Yeah. Yeah. For, for us right now, like I said, we're, it's kind of twofold. We have our wholesale, which I'd say I focus more on kind of a larger network, um, that I've been able to build, you know, through just being kind of in the hemp industry now, almost two years. Um, you know, I'm very familiar with <clears throat> kind of all the processes, you know, I've been to lots of extraction labs. I've, I'm familiar with kind of every single stage. So I kind of branch out to that network and, uh, you know, move product more for wholesale at larger quantities. And then at the same time, we try to hit like a local market, mm -hmm. um, like I said, and go for more of just like a, a CBD shop. Right. I've been hearing some stories about, well, I guess it's called Delta 8. Do you know what that is and how that works? Delta 8. Yes, that is an interesting one. So Farmer correct me if I'm wrong here, but it's like they take hemp flour and they sort of add, what is it like extracted THC Delta 8, which I suppose is legal because the illegal one is THC Delta 9. And so what, they put that on the hemp flour and then where, what, I don't know if you can talk about that at all. If you know much about it, I, I'm really uh, yeah, curious. Yeah, I do know a good bit about it. Um, you're kind of what you said is pretty true. It's a, uh, it's an extract <clears throat> that you can get out of, you know, the hemp plant. So the Delta eight, which comes before Delta nine, which then, you know, THCA to THC. Um, so it is kind of, I guess we'll just say the word, it's a funny loophole right now, or it's just, it, it didn't exist, you know, a couple months ago. Mm -hmm. So it just kind of came, came into the market. Um, and I guess it's kind of this in between between CBD and THC. So it's, you know, it's a little stronger than CBD, but not quite still that psychoactive THC. Um, so it does or doesn't have psychoactive effects. In my opinion, I'd say it does not, does not but I guess okay. I've, I've never really tried using large quantities of it. So I guess I'm not sure, you know, if you're using a lot, what that would be like. Okay. But and yeah, then, it's, it's, it's an interesting space. Um, I guess we'll kind of see where it lands as far as legality, you know, right yeah. now it's just, there is, there's no laws because again, it's, it's just like discovering a new species of something. It just, it didn't exist before. Um, so I know, you know, a lot of guys are using that, space to try to survive and yeah. uh you know there's multiple ways you can get a d8 distillate and kind of what you were referring to is um applying that to a smokable flower in some form okay well um, where like how do they make the, the the d8 extract what what can you tell me about that that i don't know the in depths of the actual extraction process i've been kind of researching that um but like i said it is newer and you know it's always hard to find information on new stuff like that especially because you know a lot of times those are probably slightly trade secrets from labs that are like all right if we found a way to extract this and we're making money we're not just going to share it with everybody hmm. um so i'm not sure in what way and how they extract it but i definitely would be interested to learn more myself so and then they what they spray it on the the hemp buds is that right yeah so that is one way that um it is used so if you get let's say like a kilo of distillate and then again coming up with kind of a formulation um there's you know you could dip flour in it you know kind of like a traditional moon rock or i don't even know what that uh, is <laughs> in my mind moon rocks actually come from the moon but go ahead <laughs> <laughs> yeah 
Yeah, no, I'm a simpleton kind of a, in that sense. A new hybrid way, which I guess would be the spraying, um, where you yeah kind of formulate the distillate so you can spray it onto the flower and kind of coat it, and then you know when a consumer smokes it, then they're going to get the benefits of the CBD flower, and then they're also going to get that um, I guess whatever the D8 hmm. kind of feeling is as well. And then does that end up on like in a legal market, or is that on like a black market, or where? Where does that product go? Or do the, the consumers who are buying it, do they know that's what they're buying? That's a good question. I'll say it's probably a mixture of both. So you can go into most CBD shops right now and find D8 um, cartridges if you wanted to. Uh, most likely you, you could find some D8 sprayed flour. Hmm. Um, so you can legally buy that in a store, in a retail store. Okay. Um, and then also, yeah, I guess I'm, I'm not sure if it's close enough to a THC feeling that it's, you know, hitting the black market as well. And, you know, people there finding it enjoyable. Hmm. Very interesting. Yeah, it is. It is a pretty interesting, um, I guess, product. Right. D8 is a tricky one because it's, it's, you know, you just don't know where it's going to go. I guess, it, like I said, it, it will be interesting to see if it's something, um, you know, the state decides to say, you know what, we're going to kind of close the door on that or is it going to be another mm. middle ground kind of like cbd where it's just you know some loose guidelines and go from there well you said like a traditional moon rock what what does that what did that mean like what is a, a moon rock yeah moon rock would be i guess taking we'll say like a hemp flower dipping that into a cbd distillate and then rolling it in cbd keef so then you end up with this, it almost looks like a rock, hence why they call it moon rock. So you don't even see the flower anymore. You just kind of get this rock ball looking object that is super high potency of CBD because you dipped it in CBD distillate. You also rolled it into keef. Tell me what you keef is. Really what is. Is that like the trichomes or what, what, what's keef? Yeah, that would be like the trichomes and the kind of the powdery trichomes that you pull out of, um, let's say, like a trimming machine, or even if you're doing hand trimming, um, you know, we use trim bins. So when we trim, there's, everybody trims over a little bin, and then that has like a little basically screen on it that filters mm. and catches all the bigger pieces. And then when you lift it up, what you're left with underneath is that powdery trichome. Okay. And I'm guessing that there is like an equivalent to this on the THC side, like a, a, is a moon rock also something that they can do that with THC and, and, uh, yes. Yeah. That's okay. pretty common. So like if you went to the medical dispensaries, you could buy, um, like a medical version of a moon rock it would be the same, pretty much the same exact thing, except with THC. I should get my medical card so I can do some undercover research. Yeah. It's uh, medical cards are great to have. Thanks for the tip. <laughs> um, what else should we talk about? This is interesting. I just actually want to keep talking about Delta Eight. This is fascinating yeah. to me because so our yeah. so farmers are making money from this. This is like they're making money from Delta Eight. Yeah. Yes, and I guess that's probably why it's starting to take off too. Because it's you know it's almost a whole new market. You know, we just discovered a whole new product. So. It's, you know, a little bit of kind of whatever start to the races. That's not the right phrase. Sprint. It's a sprint. Hmm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Everyone's like, all right, if you're, you know, you can get, you can find the right outlet and r some stores that are selling it. Um, and it's also kind of the same thing where you're having to educate customers again. Cause like you said, well, do people even know about this? Most people don't. Um, so it's, it is a little bit of the same issue. You almost have a CBD where you have a new product that's great. Um, but you also have a lot of education to do along the way. Right. Yeah. Education is key here in this industry. Yeah, it really is. It's not, it's, it's not as easy as just, you know, finding a store selling a product. Um, and that's, I guess why I really, again, come back to the community and I use the word partnership a lot, um, you know, for our wholesale partners you know i don't like people that sell our products in the store it's a partnership you know we hmm. we do the same thing with stores where we have super low wholesale pricing but i go to a store owner and i say hey listen 
I'm giving you a really good deal here, not so you can turn around and charge your customers more, but if you keep your prices low, we keep our prices low, we, you know, we can move more of this and more people can benefit rather than, you know, charging such a large amount. Right. Um, so again, it's, it really comes back to that mentality of if you're going to be more of that capitalistic, you know, I need all the money and the profits, or are you going to, or are you willing to, you know, kind of change and evolve and look at this business differently? Right. Yeah, that's, uh, that's what I would like to see is that sort of like paradigm shift that we talked about where people yeah, are more sure. concerned about the important things in the world, you know, the people of the world and the world itself rather than lining your pockets. And, uh, cause you can't take it with you, right? Like, I, I don't know. I, uh, I'm going to climb up on my soapbox here. I was like, I was talking to my kids earlier today, just about like my daughter asked me if there are any, if there's anyone in the world who's a trillionaire. And I was like, well, good question. Maybe Jeff Bezos, or if he's not yet, he probably will be soon. And right. It's like, who, why would anyone need all of the money? You know, it's, it just seems really out of balance in terms of, you know, the haves and the have nots, I guess, if that's what you want to yeah. call it. But we're all like born into this world. And it's like you, it's just frustrating to me because it's like you, you almost can't be born into the world uh, and then just like live your life. You have to then, you know, get a job and like pay bills. And it just seems really like, I don't know, this is way off topic, but. Um. No, this is definitely in uh, my, my vein of topic for sure. Um, yeah, I think you're, you're saying it right mm -hmm. there. It's, it's, and the funny thing is, it's just, it could all change if we all just changed our mindset. Yeah. You know, like. Yeah. Somebody, let's say, like that has that kind of money. If they just change their mindset, they could literally change the world and, you know, not solve everything. But this isn't that hard. Um, you know, we're all humans. And I know there's a lot of division out in the world right now. Um, and it's easy to find, you know, disagreements with anybody. That's not hard. Right. But what is hard is to focus on the places you do agree with. Yep. Um, and for me, I always look at just, you know, can we just start looking at others as human beings and start there, you know, whether or not you agree or you disagree on anything, you're both just people that deserve love and respect. Um, everybody wants to be heard. Everyone wants to be valued. That's, that's not special to any one person. Right. And if we just always remember that, man, the world would be such a better place. Such a better place. Yeah. It's like all of the political division that's happening now, like on the the extremism, it's like the one side just forgets that the other side is human, and they they're they're then dehumanized, and then it's really easy to hate them if they're not human. It's just it's it's so frustrating. It just like hurts your heart when yeah, you see what's yeah. going on in this world. And I think the hemp is this perfect like bipartisan thing that could bring so much healing back, even politically. You know, add that to the list of what it can heal individuals communities politics the yeah. world yeah definitely agree with that yeah uh so i feel like we are we're just like on like on the edge of something truly amazing and uh that that gives me hope and you know i've just through talking to people on this podcast i i see it happening and yeah because i want to live in that world i want my kids to live in in that world, not this world that's, you know, just separated between people who have a very small percentage of the people in the world who have everything. And then the rest of us who, you know, you're just living paycheck to paycheck and you're, you're one, you know, financial disaster away from total ruin. I don't know. It's frustrating. Uh, well, I like to say it's just the, you know, it's just a call for love, you know? Yeah. That's just, really what it is. You know, you can only, you, a person can only focus on one thing at a time. You can only think about one thing at a time and you can only filter your thoughts really through one space at a time. And if we all decided again to choose that space and view to be love, um, that has the power to transform. And we've seen that, you know, throughout history and mankind, when we stop and reflect and just love each other, it, it truly can change everything. 
Amen to that. Caleb Kaufman, it's great to talk to you. Yeah, and I guess maybe if I have a moment, I'll just end on a little bit. I'd like to just share my little bit of why I got into hemp in the first place, if that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. Why did you get into hemp in the first place? Yeah, um, kind of like I said, really, it's that personal experience. Um, so for me, in my, you know, I'm, I'm 34 right now. I'm trying to think sometime early 30s, um, random, randomly basically remembered that I had experienced um, childhood sexual trauma oh. and kind of sent me down this path of healing um, and counseling. And that is where I was first introduced to CBD. Um, and I remember it very clearly. I was sitting in a counseling session, just talking through stuff and just was like, oh, have you heard about CBD or hemp? And I was just like, wait, what? <laughs> and, you know, more of that holistic mindset in general. Mm -hmm. um, so I started doing my research. That's how I got into the field. And then also with the hopes that, you know, one day I would, you know, reach a platform like this and just be able to say that out loud to as many people as want to listen. Yeah. Um, and I guess, you know, my voice would want to just say like, um, as a, you know, human male, you know, those things happen. We don't talk about it. Um, it's hard, you know, sometimes there's shame associated with it's, you know, trauma is a very tough journey. And if you're vulnerable and honest with yourself and those around you, you can find healing. Um, and I guess part of what I wanted to do with hemp is, you know, use hemp because it, can literally bring you physical healing um, and has helped me tremendously with, you know, my trauma and my PTSD. Um, so I was, you know, officially diagnosed with PTSD. So yeah. CBD for me was literally a life changer. And then on top of that saying, you know what, like it's twofold, there's the hemp, but then there's also just having the voice of saying, Hey, we, we need to create a space to talk about this stuff. Um, and I, you know, I think traditionally men are, you know, scared to share their emotions just because of the way that society kind of projects upon, you know, the male is, you know, be the tough guy. Don't talk about feelings, you know, right. toughen up. Yeah. Um, and it's that, that attitude that. that is, has sort of like, that, that's sort of why we're, the world is in the state that it's in right now. I think Correct. just right there. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, for me, it was just wanting to you know, eventually get to a place where we could start sharing that story of hemp, my personal experience with it, my personal experience with trauma. And again, just kind of be a voice of light and just remind people, you know, there is goodness out there and there is healing out there. And uh, yeah, hopefully people listening, you know, that brings them some kind of comfort and hope and um, just a space that they can make some steps for themselves. Right. Well, thank you for sharing that part of your story. Yeah, it's definitely uh, my pleasure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Vulnerability is, it, it's like only like true badasses can, can, can get to that spot and actually show vulnerability. And uh, I think that's a, a lesson that just people can learn from. So thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. That's Caleb Kaufman from Lancashire Hemp. I will have a link to his website on the show page for this episode at LancasterFarming.com. All right, well, that does it for the show this week. Thank you for listening. And thank you to anyone who was involved in the Pennsylvania Hemp Summit. The organizers did a great job putting it together. All of the guests were super informative, and all of the participants seemed to get a lot out of it. So uh, I'm going to try to do a recap of the Pennsylvania Hemp Summit here on this show in the next coming weeks. So stay tuned for that. Uh, otherwise, that's it. My name is Eric Harlock. I am the digital editor at Lancaster Farming Newspaper. Check us out online at LancasterFarming.com. Get a subscription. Uh, sign up for the Industrial Hemp Newsletter. All that stuff you can find it there at LancasterFarming.com. All right. Until next time, I will see you in the newspaper.
industrial hemp. Episode 112 of the Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast is copyright 2020 by Lancaster Farming Newspaper, which is part of the Steinman Communications family. Today's show is written and recorded, edited and produced by Eric Herla. The music you hear throughout the show is courtesy of Tin Bird Shadow. <laughs>